Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, second class in a season of prayer. Uh, tonight, uh, as we enter into this um, topic, uh, I'm going to be talking about a specific type of prayer, and that's praying for our nation, that that's getting outside of our normal daily prayers for our normal concerns, uh, but to pray specifically uh, for the health of our nation, the spiritual health of our nation. Uh, and I hope that as we enter into this topic and begin discussions of what it is to pray for our nation, that uh, we find a deeper understanding of prayer and uh, deeper ability to access um, uh, looking at a broader uh, aspect of prayer than we normally do. Uh, join me as we enter into this worship. Good evening. Uh, the second uh, lesson that, we're, that I'm going to uh, be bringing you uh, in our season of prayer and talking about uh, our prayer life and focusing on our prayer life, um, I will be emphasizing uh, tonight prayers for our nation, which is kind of a different type of prayer that we do not uh, generally do, um, but we'd like everybody to think about it, think about the possibilities of adding this type of prayer uh, to our prayer life um, so that we can pray for the nation that we live in and the nation that we love. And I begin uh, this lesson by asking you, uh, what is prayer? that it's a very simple, very basic question, but if we don't understand what is prayer, uh, then we're not going to get the right answers um, in our study. So I very simply want to ask you uh, to consider, what is prayer? Because it is fundamental. Um, prayer is our avenue to speak, uh, to communicate with our Heavenly Father. Prayer is our innermost expression of our spiritual needs. Through prayer, we can find strength of spirit, guidance, wisdom, joy, and inner peace that far too often we deny ourselves. Why do we deny ourselves uh, this inner peace? A lot of times it's because we don't want to open ourselves up to prayer that we are in the midst of something and we deny ourselves the ad avenue of prayer because we don't want God looking at us at that time. Because God is the only being, the only entity in this whole world that we cannot lie to. That we can lie to ourselves, we can lie to our friends and our family, but God knows our hearts. God knows what we're thinking before we think it and He knows our intentions. Uh, a few verses uh, that I have uh, about prayer um, come uh, first from the book of Psalms, chapter 118, and verses 5 and 6. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious space. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Psalms chapter 138, verse 3. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9 through 11. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a finger, pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame, and you, you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. We also have Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. These verses in the Old and the New Testament uh, illustrate for us the importance of prayer, what it does, and what we can do with prayer, what it does for us. Because why is prayer so important? I think the number one answer uh, of why prayer is so important, because it allows us true and honest expression uh, with our God that we can have our faith be an active faith, that we meet God in prayer, that even though He knows our intents before we um, know them, that He knows our needs and our wants and our desires, but by truly and honestly expressing those, um, we gain strength from that honest expression, and we gain strength in our faith because we know that God is faithful and will answer our prayers. In this class and in these 20 minutes, I'm going to be focusing on a particular type of prayer, as I said, and that's praying for our nation because we think we can all agree that 2020 has been a pretty unique year and it hasn't always been the best. I personally have had a pretty good 2020, but it's also been the most challenging year on many different aspects uh, to a lot of people. Um, I think we can also all agree that the country is not going the way that we would want it to. Um, And often the answer to that falls into um, politics, whether you see things or whether you exist as, a, as someone who's more conservative or more liberal, but that's not the entire nation. If you look at it from the way God looks at it, that every day, everywhere, in every town, in every county, in every city, every person sins against God constantly all the time, in thought, in action, in intent. We lie, cheat, steal, murder. We have a multitude of sins that this country commits on a daily, hourly, and on a minute-by-minute basis. It must be overwhelming to God to see the rebellion uh, of His people. And we find um, that One person, only one person in the entire Bible has been called to lead a life of one that mirrors what God endures from us, from His people on a daily basis. And I bring this up by means of focusing our attention not on our particular problems and not on this election season that pits the country against right versus left and libertarian or totalitarian, all these big words and philosophies about basically how we're going to govern ourselves. But God called one person in the book of Hosea, and He called one man, and that is His prophet Hosea, to lead a life that is utterly unique in all of Scripture that if we turn to uh, the book of Hosea, and in verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord which came to Hosea the son of Beeri during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, to set the time frame in which this book is written. And during the days of Jeroboam the son of Johash, king of Israel, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry. For the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. 
This verse could be written today. This verse could be written at any and all times. God is angry with his people, and he tells Hosea, I want you to go out, and I want you to marry a particular woman because she is going to have you endure something in your life that I endure always. Take a moment to focus on this as we continue reading. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. He names his first person, his first child, Jezreel, or another way that we are in contention uh, with each other. And it's a very weird, unique name. You wouldn't want to go walking around with it. Um, then she conceived a short time later and bore him uh, another uh, child and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Loruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Uh, in other words, taking this in the personal uh, aspect that Hosea is called to live is that I named my first son uh, a bone of contention between me and the Lord. I named my second child, I will no longer have love. I don't know if this is my own child. And we, and then in uh, continuing down in verse 8, when she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. That also means, being that God knew her heart, that also means my first child is a child of contention, my second child I'm not sure is mine. The third child I know is not mine. He's publicly announcing that. I want you to stop and think about this as we consider this in the light of praying for our nation. God is calling Hosea to marry this woman, not just to marry her, but to love her. That she gives birth to three children and that there is no greater pain on this earth that we know of, really, than this pain of betrayal. Yes, there is medical pain, pain of cancer, um, pain of injury. Those are specific things that hinder us. But think about how debilitating the pain is. There is no sting of betrayal that is more personal, more hurtful, that flows throughout all aspects of our life than to lose the honor, the integrity, the love of a spouse. And that God has called Hosea to experience in himself and in his life what God experiences on a daily basis. How many of us would continue to sin in our personal life that when we hit our thumb with the hammer and we so casually cuss, when we're given an extra $2 change uh, when we go to the store and we steal that money as opposed to give it back, that when we casually lie to our family and friends and say, you know what, I've got another, uh, something else has come up. No, I can't make it over to the house. That we make an excuse. An excuse is just another word for a lie to save someone's feelings. What if we thought about that when we did that, when we sinned against our Father, that He feels that sting of betrayal, that pain and anguish, as if our spouse just cheated on us. We could stop there, and we could spend hours doing nothing but talking about uh, what we've just thought of and discovered, and, and to really bring out... Uh, that information and to let it wash over us and understand that when we get 
cheated on, when we, uh, someone lies about us, when we have difficulties, when we just have the normal, the decision goes against us at work, we were promised one thing and it didn't happen, the normal disappointments, we deal with that all the time. But God experiences it, uh, these things, these sins against us as an intense betrayal as, as intense as when a spouse betrays us. That kind of puts uh, things into a different context for us that every nation that's ever existed at any time always stores up for itself wrath from the Father because so many people sin against Him. We sin against Him every day. And so, when we think about, we often think about and focus on, it's very easy to look at the, the sins of others and say, well, I wouldn't do that, or that person's life is messed up, and look at where um, they're going wrong, or it's the Democrats' fault, or it's the Republicans' fault, or it's all our faults, because we all sin on a daily basis and fall short of the glory of God. And that when we pray, not for ourselves, that when we look outward at this nation that we love, it's imperfect because it's peopled with imperfect people. We might be aspirational more than other countries and say, we're not just here because we're German or French or Italian, and Germans and French and Italians have always lived in one place. We're here in the United States because our ancestors came here for a particular reason, that our country was founded for a particular reason. That's great. That's noble. That appeals to the higher nature of all of ourselves. But even our founding fathers were sinful men. This nation was conceived... Uh, we, fa we have in our founding documents, it was conceived in liberty. That's the story that we tell ourselves. But it also contained the sin of slavery that we still pay for today uh, in our relations with one another and a very bitter legacy of slavery and what happened afterwards. All of these things is, as the Bible writers would say, is We've stored up wrath for ourselves and for our posterity. That these are the sins carried down generation among, upon generation that we need to pray for and say, Heavenly Father, we are imperfect. We do sin against you and cause you this pain. But Father, do not punish us for those things. We still have love for you. We still believe in you. We still have faith in you. And keep us together as a nation. Help us to get better and help lead us to a much better place. That as we pray and open ourselves up, that we can have that honest and true communication from us to our Heavenly Father and to say, Father, we are imperfect. Father, we need your help as a nation. And the way that we do that is by hitting our knees both figuratively and rhetorically to open ourselves up and to say, we have problems as this nation. I hate to break it to everybody, when we think about this, God, Jesus, is not even American. That we should never, ever labor under the delusion that, and to project our political thoughts of the day onto Jesus and think that Jesus is going to come from the White House because we voted in the correct administration. God is so much larger than politics. Politics is the expression of ways of doing things. It's, it's of broad ideas. Those are great. Those are important. Those are noble. 
both on the political right and left, but that is not God. That is not what our Heavenly Father is here to do. He is here, came here, died, and His message to us to distill it way down is to say that we all are sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all need His help in order to get to heaven. The same thing with this nation, that when we forget who God is, when we forget the morality and the standards that He's given us, that that should be our focus as Christians to say, help raise us Father, help raise our standards so that we can be more like you in all of our actions. I uh, leave this lesson for you. Um, as we take time after this class to say prayers that think about what we're praying for, think about the prayers that we are asking our Father for our nation to heal our nation from its past difficulties, to heal our nation during its present turmoil, and to, and to guide our nation to somehow, some way, be closer to the standard that God has illuminated for us. I leave this lesson for you and thank you for your attention.